Kitco Mining's special coverage of the CIM Convention and Expo is brought to you by CSE, the Canadian Securities Exchange. Welcome to Kitco Mining, I'm Niels Christensen. Today we're at the CIM Convention and Exposition. Uh, today I'm getting to talk to uh, Guy Dearnay, VP of Project uh, uh, project evaluation for Cisco Gold Royalties. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, Guy. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking with you because um, you're the guy who decides <laughs> if, if, if an investment gets money or not. And I think that's, you know, for investors, how do they, how do they know what a good company is? But before we get into that, um, I, one of the reasons I, I reached out to you as well is because of your presentation at CIM here on cognitive biases and how that's actually detrimental to the mining sector. Um, I would just quickly, what do you mean by this? And like, yeah. I, I think I understand, but I'd love to, to, to find out like what, because it's all about project evaluation. It's all about exploration. Sure. So please explain what your, what your premise is of your, of your presentation. Yeah, so I mean, I spend a lot of time looking at different projects around the world. And if you look at the number of gold projects that were constructed just in Canada and since 2010, there's been around 20 separate projects that have been built. Uh, and of those, over a third of them have failed. Another third of them are underproducing significantly. So like the majority of gold projects being built are having major issues. And most of them are, are due to one or both of these factors, resource estimation or overestimation where, where there's errors in the estimation methodology or the classification. And the other one is the estimation of costs, either in the capital costs or operating costs. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at projects all the time trying to figure out, like, is this one of those, is this one of the majority projects? And, and unfortunately, you know, if we look at plane crashes, for example, there's always a really detailed postmortem. They dig into the details and keep asking why, 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 until they get to the core root cause of, of the reason why the plane crashed. Whereas uh, in mining projects, we don't get to that, the, the bottom core level. Uh, I guess I'm fortunate that oftentimes we get to, to, to look under the hood and, and, and see, see, uh, see what happened, talk to the people and, and get a better feel for that. And a lot of the times when you're getting to the core of it, it's, it's these cognitive biases. So is it just like not, like when you say evaluating the, the resource, like just not understanding how the resource is made? Like, you know, like, oh, it's a, it's, it's a core pre, it's a, it's a copper core pre. Like, I'm just, I'm sort of wondering, like, yeah. what's... I mean, there's, you know, my, my background is partially in, in resource estimation, and, and particularly for, for precious metals, there's a lot of traps uh, in terms of the process to get to the, to the estimation itself, uh, just because the, the style of data has very uh, log normal distributions, so a lot of very high, or few very high values are, have the potential to be overpowering the estimation. And if you're not careful in all the different steps, then you can, can create overestimations. Mm -hmm. And then there's tools to sort of classify the risk on, on, those, on those estimations. Um, it's just a matter of applying them correctly and a human has to decide what it is. And, and that comes back to the cognitive biases where the, the root cause of these failures are often related to humans that are making assumptions uh, that build into the project through the estimation, through the mining, through the metallurgy. And those, all those assumptions sort of aggregate into to a project. And oftentimes, if they're all optimistic in one direction, then instead of being linearly worse a little bit each time, they, sometimes they, they compound and, and aggregate in a way that makes it much, much worse than you would expect. So how do you get away from the bias? <laughs> yeah, so, so it's very difficult. I mean, the, the main, the, the core of what, what my conclusion of my, my presentation is uh, there's, there's two factors that are really important. One of them is the relationship between the project owners, so the president CEO of the company or the vice presidents, and the relationship with, with the, the consultants. So the, the consultants want to do a good, do good work. They're, they're trying to help the client advance the project. And oftentimes there's the, the power dynamic of that situation makes it so that uh, the consultant will maybe twist a little bit and, and be helpful in certain areas, but it's the compounding of that, that that's sort of uh, detrimental. Uh, the, other, the other aspect, I think, which is um, really hard to, to get our hands or head around is basically the, the, the confirmation bias or the commitment bias where the, the company, it's only you know, driving forces to move the project 
forward, forward, to the next study, to the next study, and not enough re-questioning of, of what uh, occurred in, in, the private, in the previous steps. Does AI solve a lot of this stuff? You know, like we're, we're talking, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I, you know, I've, I've done some machine learning and, and different aspects of different projects, but I think this is a, it's, it's really hard actually to, to, to find solutions for this because it's such a soft problem. Mm -hmm. And like uh, the, the NI43-101, which sort of regulates the laws around how to uh, estimate uh, resources and provide feasibility studies uh, for projects, it's poorly suited to deal with these human problems. Uh, how do you how do you legislate that a, a, a professional is extra careful and provides a, the data or, or the assumptions that are reasonable? And I guess we should point out though, like cognitive bias doesn't necessarily mean bad actors. You know, it's no, not it's exactly. not a brex. It's not. Uh, it's it's just simply you're caught up in your project exactly. and you want the best for your project. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I know some of the people involved in some of these projects, uh, including the project owners. And, and they, there's huge amounts of regret. Nobody has the intention to make these things fail. Yeah, there's definitely not, yeah. it, it, very rare are the cases where, where it's bad actors that are, that are trying to, to make the project worse. I, I guess maybe not, can you give us an example of like really bad cognitive bias? Like how, like, you know, what, was, it, was it obvious from the beginning, you know, like, cause I guess like one of the things is, you know, like investors, they're bombarded with like key phrases, you know, yeah. like, we're open at all levels, you know. Yeah, yeah. target rich sky. environment. Yeah, it's, you know, so I'm, but so I'm sort of like, cause that, I think that the jargon adds to those biases as yeah. well. So I'm sort of wondering like, is there, are there, tra can, can you see traps? Is it, or is it, is it so like you say, it's such a soft issue that it's like, you don't really know the fatal flaw until it's literally too Yeah, I, I think, it's more at the study level. So once you get to a scoping level study or a feasibility study where, where you can actually do the work and, and figure these things out. And the easiest thing to do is, is compare against uh, producing mines. So in Canada, there's been several recent NI43 101s on uh, mines that are in production. And you can take those costs, the mining costs, the processing costs, and, and sort of translate those to the, to the studies and say like, does this make sense? line by line, given it's, it's hard to do for, for the typical investor, but it's a good way to test uh, the reliability of these new studies. Well, okay, and getting to sort of general, so you look at a lot of projects um, and, and basically you decide whether Osisco Royalties gives them, well, you're, you're part of it. I'm part of a you're team, part of, you're part absolutely, of a team. yeah. It's, is it this, I know it's not exactly the same process, but you know, are there tips for generalist investors? Like yeah. how, do you, how do you know what you're getting, because I guess, you know, in the last run up, which it, we, like we haven't seen this this cycle, but like the last run up, anything with gold, yeah. you know, money was being thrown at it. And I think that really, really hurt the industry. And I think that's why we're sort of suffering today is because how do you know what's a good project? What's a good project? You know, and what's and what's a project like and there's so many different like. A good for some people, a good project is just something that's going to be taken out. Yeah. Another good project, you know, like very rarely do actually people invest in a gold company now because it's going to be a mine. It's you know, well, we want it. We want to take. Yeah, we want it taken out. Like. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's hard to evaluate based on a, one simple factor. I mean, you can do a lot of work just by looking at the the corporate presentation of of a company, and you know, you, you could go through a checklist of like. Grade. Grade is number one. If, if grade is good, it forgives a lot of other issues with the deposit. And then if it's an open pit, what's the strip ratio? Uh, metallurgical recovery, and community, ESG, all these different aspects. And it's, it's not necessarily uh, how good the project is, but whether or not it's, it has a fatal flaw. Yeah. And, and one trick actually for, for the generalist investor, what they could do is make, make your own checklist of things you want to see. And as you go through the corporate presentation, the, if, if there's aspects that are not on with with residing within the corporate presentation, it's maybe something they're trying to hide or, or not necessarily looking the at. Cognitive biases again. Well, yeah, maybe, <laughs> exactly. So if you need to dig in, scratch yeah, and yeah. find, let's say, for example, the stripping ratio, well, maybe that's the weakest part of the project and you should figure out whether that is a, a potential fatal flaw for, for an investment. Is it, okay, so, one of the things I hear is, you know, the top three things are management, management, management. Yeah. Um, is is management that important, or can like can a mediocre management team 
make a mediocre project good. Like, yeah, I, potentially. I, I think one of the reasons why it's so important and people re return to it is a good management team will select a good geology. Mm -hmm. They're selecting the project. I mean, they're attaching their, their the next three, five, ten years of their lives to that project. So they're going to do some due diligence to figure out whether they like the geology uh, or the potential. And then to advance it, you know, you need to have a team that's able to raise the money. It's very expensive to, to develop a project. If they can't raise the money, then it's not going to advance. Uh, and then spend the money correctly. So, I mean, that's that's really important. And, and we, we spend a lot of time looking to, discussing, visiting, face face to face with, with the management teams to, to try to get a better understanding of where their mind space is. Um, how does the market look right now? Like, you know, for, for Cisco Gold Royalties, yeah. you know, like, so... The con like even even at this conference here today, very little focus on gold right now. You know, it's all critical metals. It's yeah. all like, is it easy for you guys to find projects? Is it getting more difficult? Uh, I would say, you know, Osisco has been in a very, it's in a very good situation right now. I think we invested fairly heavily in the lowest part of the market, mm -hmm. uh, and we're positioned now with a lot of development assets, which are going to naturally come to to fruition going through the study. So. Just in the past year, we've had four fe important feasibility studies, Casino, Windfall, Caribou, and uh, Token Tin Zinho. So those are four projects that we invested, you know, years ago, and they're advancing on their own, and now they're getting to the point of permitting and financing. So we have a lot of uh, built-up uh, momentum behind us. We can, we can take our time and, and, and pick our, our spots, but we, we are, we're, we're looking at you know several things right now that I think would 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 move the needle for Cisco, uh, and you know last year we did four smaller investments, but some of those are are looking better already. Uh, yeah. So I guess another criteria that you know jurisdiction. Um, what do you you know it, how how important is jurisdiction? Is it again? Is it does it does project beat everything else if it's a really good project in a not so great jurisdiction. Yeah. There's a limit, you know, North Korea and a few other countries where we, we won't dip our toes into. I think... Um, That's probably a good choice. I'm just North Korea. Yeah, That's, North yeah. Korea. I mean, <laughs> as Koreas go, it's it's not on the top yeah. top two, let's say. Um, I, it definitely is a huge, huge impact and the geology just has to be that much better or the project needs to be that much better to overcome the, the jurisdictional risk. Um, you know, our, our current portfolio is very heavily weighted towards Canada and U.S. So, we're, you know, we're a little bit spoiled in that way. And if you look at the other royalty companies, they have a little bit more jurisdictional risk. And, and that, you know, can provide some air cover for us to, to, to dip our toes a little bit. You know, we've invested in uh, Sol Gold in, in Ecuador, the Cascavel project, which Ecuador is becoming a better and better jurisdiction. Um, yeah, so it definitely has to go into the formula to try to figure out how to value things. Um Finally, I guess your you know the, the royalty role in the mining sector it has taken uh, a big front seat in financing in moving these projects forward. Is that a trend that continues? Do you think? I mean, do, do investors come back? And I, I guess you know what does it take to get investors to come back? So you know, like the the the, the royalty side doesn't have to play such a big role in getting projects forward, uh, even just keeping projects alive. Yeah, so I, I think definitely, you know, in Canada in particular, when, for project financings, there's there's always a, there's tends to be a gap in the middle stack of the capital yeah. raise. So debt is there for a part, equity is there, and there's a gap where somebody else needs to step in and, and do that part of the financing. And, you know, over the past five years, I think that's, then royalties or streams have solidified the position as that's the third option. It makes sense, non-dilutive, and and depending on the project, you know, it's not too burdensome to, to the to project success. I think, you know, in the industry as a whole, uh, depends where you are in jurisdictionally. Uh, we we just we're completing a, a transaction the CSA, which is a, a, a copper silver mine in, in Australia. And speaking with the Australians, it's still they have a strong allergy to, to royalties. It's everybody you speak to down there, uh, but they're experiencing more difficulty now as well uh, to, wow. uh, to to get that equity piece, uh, which is much more uh, available to them in the Australian market. So, I think there's room for more of this type of uh, financing. There's an increasing openness towards it as well. Does 
does an improvement in cognitive biases like that i guess like a stronger understanding of the gold market does that get investors back in like that i guess that that yeah i think i think the main thing is like we need to have fewer failures and, and more success stories and that comes with just you know people being properly calibrated to have the good projects and the right studies to back those projects so that the the expectations are met and that the projects go forward and and everybody makes uh makes a good return on their investment. I think, I mean, that's a, it's a slow process, right? Like, I think, I think there's been some loss in credibility in the market. Uh, and there needs to be, you know, several success stories, both on the exploration side, uh, to get people inspired to be like, Jesus, you know, we got a, this got a 10, 10 X on, on certain, you know, two or three in, in a year, I think would, would get the generalist more interested, uh, to, to get into the juniors and then for the for the the development companies you know we need to see a few success stories come out of that i was going to say it does feel more than we just need higher prices you know like some people yeah. you know a lot of people say oh we just need higher prices and and investors like they can't ignore the sector for yeah. very long and it, i feel like we've been saying that for for a few years now and it's just like it feels like maybe what we need is just a, a big um a, a new a new discovery yeah. to you know like well it's it's funny actually that the lithium space is is going a little bit crazy it's yeah. it's gone it's it's cooled down a little bit but you know we have exposure to Patri patriot battery metals which is the james Bay of quebec and yeah. and that's a that's been a huge discovery and it's got the australian market super inspired and looking for what's the next things and you, you've seen a trend now of, of people inserting lithium in their press releases uh to try to get a, a bump on it and, and it's worked to a certain extent but even that is you know it's short-lived and and but discoveries like Pat patriot battery metals uh i think are going to help get people back into the market well it's and i guess it's that it's that credibility again it's that you know like there are still good projects out there yeah absolutely yeah no i'm looking forward to, i think i think w w with your comment towards uh, the gold prices is, is that is that enough i think it helps in a big way for projects that are starting up, you know, in a in an increasing gold price environment, uh, if if there's shortfalls in capital or or startup issues, uh, the gold price forgives a lot to to get keep the bank the banks full and, and and keep the projects moving forward. So, I think it's a it's going to be very useful for for the many projects that are sort of being constructed now or or, or in permitting for sure. Guy, um, thank you very much for uh, for coming to speak with us today. I just I really like the the optimism in your in your presentation here, um, and I uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much for watching Kiko Mining. Stay tuned for more coverage from the CIM Convention and Exposition. If you like what you see, remember to uh, like the subscribe button down below. Kitco Mining's special coverage of the CIM Convention and Expo is brought to you by CSE, the Canadian Securities Exchange.